I've got Sam Bosefield from Samson and the Switchblade here with me today to do a little bit of an interview. Sounds good. Hi. So, um, Sam, I, it's been a couple of months since I first became familiar with the Switchblade, and I've just been blown away by what you've been doing. So, can you tell everybody how did you how did you invent this flying car? Well, the Switchblade um, is something that came out of a project where I was doing for cutting edge, fast, almost supersonic flight. And I took that project right up to where it could have gone forward and all of a sudden, bang, you know, the, the fellow I was working with had passed away. And I kind of left that project in the lurch and I looked at what does aviation really need? And what I felt it needed was to become more practical, something that you could use every day, not just on the weekends for fun. That's awesome. So my me was, I mean, first off, the switch blade is beautiful. It's just, ready, and I want one. Um, but people are talking about flying cars. Tell me what's different about the switch blade. Well, the switch blade flying cars, is, conception of it is that it's great. It might be a utilitarian thing, but it's going to be at best a mediocre car and a mediocre plane because you're combining the two and you rarely can come up with something different than that. But in our case, we didn't find that to be true because we went to three wheels. We were very close to the weight and construction of an aircraft. And so instead of being mediocre, we're actually on the ground. We outperform a Jaguar XK8, wow. a V8 powered Jag. So it's no slouch. It's fun to drive. It's zippy. It's, uh, it's a good performer. And then in the air, um, you know, all our engineering, wind tunnel testing to date shows that we should be flying upwards of 160 miles an hour, maybe up to 200 miles an hour, top speed. And that's no slouch for an aircraft. Now, let me ask you a question because I don't know if you can talk about this, but there were some really interesting things that happened with your wind tunnel test. Sure, the wind tunnel was interesting. We went that way because it gives nice hard data. You get within 3% of actuality, of reality, of where it will be in the wind tunnel. So that's why the big guys use it. It gets you very accurate data. So we were a bit surprised as we walked in. We knew that we had uh, lift being generated by the body, but we couldn't really tell how much. And the surprise came when we found out that it was significant and that no matter how steeply we banked or pitched the plane upwards, even 30 degrees above the horizon, it did not stall. And so at first, wow. you know, I was thinking, oh, this is great. There's no, I have a, I have a stall proof airplane, but that wasn't the truth because the wings will stall and then you have the body. Uh, and, and that was our problem uh, where we had to overcome and go back in the wind tunnel the second time because the body's center of lift, if you were to say a balancing point is forward from the wings center of lift. So when the wing stalled, you had lift being generated further towards the nose. So we had to redesign the tail, which we did, came out perfect, we're happy. Oh, that's great. Now, we were talking about um, that it's actually classified as a motorcycle, and there's some advantages to that. I thought this was fascinating. Yeah, the, it worked out that way. We didn't have to be honest. We wanted to do a flying car, but as we got into it, three wheels and less is classed as a motorcycle. And so as we developed the design in it, in it, fell just where it needed to fall uh, with that. And we got into the regulations that we'd be facing. We realized, holy cow, car regulations, they're a foot tall. Motorcycle regulations, maybe half an inch. So the difference was huge, and it makes a big difference in our business plan. Wow, I bet. So um, so this will be classified as a motorcycle. So will somebody get a motorcycle license when they do this? Or Yeah, most people, when you do it, it's a trike. So you would take your trike to your exam, if you will, and the most you have is a written addition to your driver's license. Oh, wow. Because the trike, when they see you coming, a test for a motorcyclist is they have you go through a figure eight through a cones. You can't do that with a trike. So every time a trike guy shows up for that, they just go, okay, fine, done. And, and in most states, you're not required to wear a helmet. I think in all states, by the time we're done, you will not be required to wear a helmet because you're fully enclosed, have rollover protection, you have seat belts, um, sidebar intrusion protection, you know, front and rear crumple zones like a car. Uh, we don't have to do the testing to prove it, so we just incorporated it because we knew that people would feel 
as safe in our vehicle as they felt in a car, and they would drive that way. Wow. So you have to provide that kind of protection. I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about the licensing and the way that the, the license plate works. But, you know, one of the things that was the first time I saw you speak, you were talking about, you know, I live in L.A. And so in L.A. we have, uh, we're stopped to spend four hours driving 20 or 30 miles. Sure. Yeah, sure. The the idea of uh, any kind of a, a city that has airports contained within it and lots of traffic to deal with is that you can bypass most of that by flying from one small airport to the other small airport, just getting where you want to in a hurry. And then the last little bit, you've got to drive, which is fine. You have a car to do that with a switchblade. But the idea is that you can get around most of that congestion. Uh, sometimes it's not just traffic. It's that, well, it is the traffic, but it's, sometimes it's not just lots of traffic. It's accidents. It's um, road construction, uh, those kinds of things. So you know, it, it just should be able to cut down the amount of time people are spending in their cars. Right, you gotta figure. Yeah, if, and this, this comes from Department of Transportation Studies uh, in major cities all around the United States, everyone that deals with, um, with peak loads. And what they're saying is that if you take three, as little as 3% off the peak load traffic, you just pull that off the traffic load, then the rest of the cars will go twice as fast, uh, which, you know, if it's 30 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour or something like that, you're now going 40 or 60 miles an hour. So just by doing a little bit with the switchblade, just having a few switchblades, enough to be 3%, uh, that would drastically free up the rest of the traffic for other other drivers. That's amazing. So where where are we at with the switchblade? When can I get one? What's, where, what stage is it at? Yeah, sure. We are building away in Primeville, Oregon, Central Oregon. Uh, for the flying prototype, this is our fourth pro our fourth prototype overall, uh, but the flying final conforming prototype for us. So that's our pre-production prototype. Uh, that'll be flight tested hopefully, I believe, in April this year is what we're looking at right at this point in time. And then we'll have some testing. We'll get into production later in the year. And so by the end of the year, say almost Christmas time, we should have vehicles rolling off for people uh, to wow. enjoy and use. Oh, that's exciting. And you're doing a model with um, where people can contribute to building it, so it's classified as a home build. Is that right? Yes. Most of the aircraft that are cutting edge are done that way. Um, that's where all the experimentation and the, and the cutting edge vehicles and technology is introduced. And so, yes, we're doing that route. It allows us the greatest flexibility because, believe it or not, it's not that easy to do a flying car. <laughs> yeah. So... We wanted the greatest uh, avenues that we could so that we could have the best chance of success. Well, wonderful. Well, I, I think we've got a couple of videos that I want to share that you have on how this flies and what it's going to look like. I, again, I am so thrilled. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? Well, you know, it's one thing to say, um, you know, let's do a flying car and get it out there. But it's another thing to think about what it means to people's lives. Uh, it's not just a cool gizmo or something for the rich and, you know, something you park in your, with your Lamborghinis and things of that nature. Although some people might want to do that. Um, we designed it to be useful. And I think the idea for us is when people start to realize in the business sense, in the personal sense, how much freedom it gives you, how much uh, more control it gives you as to your schedule, how easy it is to expand your reach and, your ability to do things, I think that's when it's going to catch on and it's going to go beyond what you know people think of in a flying car. It's going to go into, oh no, I, this is something I have to have. When you first started talking about this, my entire vision, I think it's going to be like bringing in the microwave oven and how that changed cooking. And this car, I, I see this moving us into the future faster than anything I've seen. So I'm, I'm really thrilled, and I am going to be in line for that one of those first vehicles. So. All right. Really good. Well, we would love to see that one. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. You bet. Thanks for having me.